All right. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. This is my absolute favorite topic to talk about. So I'm excited to, to um, talk to you guys a little bit about um, what um, I have been um, looking for in terms of pertinent information for home gardeners and what they can do um, in their yard and garden setting. So in general, um, if you're here at this webinar, it probably doesn't take very much convincing to, to let you guys know why pollinators are important. And so in terms of why we should care about pollinators, um, you've probably seen this image, pollinators provide food for us. So this image was taken in partnership with the Xerces Society and Whole Foods, where they um, set up a grocery store produce section where the way we see it now, and then they redid it in terms of if we didn't have bees to pollinate our um, fruit crops. And so this kind of was a striking image that <clears throat> we could kind of see just the, the sheer impact that something like that would have. So a lot of our, our common food crops are brought to us by pollinators, um, especially bees. In addition to food for us, they also have a huge economic impact for our agricultural operations in the United States. With pollination services in the U.S., agriculture industry valued at over $20 billion a year. They produce, um, uh, re are, a lot of our staple crops are really reliant on bee pollinators. And in, on top of that, native bees themselves produce over $3 billion annually to U.S. agriculture alone. But those numbers are likely underestimates based on kind of what our limited understanding is of native bee impacts in our agricultural operations. Not only do they provide food for us and economic value, but they are also important in sustaining native plant biodiversity and native plant communities. And as a result of that, they provide food for a lot of wildlife that either, either feed on those plants themselves or the products of those plants, like those seeds, nuts, and fruit that they produce. So pollination is a mutualism most of the time, which means that both of the organisms in this situation are getting some sort of a benefit out of the equation. And in this case, um, the pollinator itself gets food and the plant increases its probability of reproducing successfully and passing on its genetic information. We've also seen through the fossil record indication of as we saw angiosperms or flowering plants start to diversify in the number of species, we also saw a corresponding diversification of the number of insect groups that are really common pollinator species, and that includes our flies, our butterflies and moths, and our bees and wasps. So flowers are designed to attract pollinators, and as a result, they have a variety of different features that make them more attractive and more user-friendly to the types of pollinators that they are catering to. And so if you look at that flower on the top left, the yellow version is what we'd see with our eyes, but um, on the right-hand side of that, we see what that flower would look like to a bee. And so a lot of flowers have these UV markings on their petals called nectar guides, which will lead bees all the way to that nectar source once they land on the petal of that flower. And so flowers that are more commonly pollinated by birds usually have kind of deeper nectar sources and um, the flower shape that makes them more accessible. And flowers that are pollinated by insects that don't have really long tongues or long um, appendages like that usually have shallower and easily accessible sources of nectar and pollen. So some pollinators are generalists, and this means that they can visit a wide variety of different types of flowering plants. The honeybee is a classic example of this. Honeybees can pollinate an immense amount of different types of flowering plants. But some pollinators are extremely specialized, and we see some very interesting associations between either two groups of organisms, and in some cases, even two specific species of organisms where they're reliant on each other. And we see a, a lot of this in orchid systems. And so some orchids, um, in terms of how they attract orchid bees, not only have some visual um, imitations of what a female bee would look like. So if you kind of have the vision of a bee, what this orchid vaguely looks like is a bee, 
But in addition to that, when they bloom, it's the time that male orchid bees are emerging. And some of these orchid species will produce a chemical scent that's identical to the pheromone of female orchid bees, which will encourage these male orchid bees to come on um, and land on those flowers and try and mate with them. And that process uh, results in the pollen packets or pollinia being deposited onto those male bees. And as they move on from flower to flower, they end up pollinating these orchids along the way. Now, my favorite kind of story about a pollinator plant associated Association. Um, and this kind of really um, made all those light bulbs go off. And it's one of my favorite stories to tell when I talk about this topic is the mystery of Darwin's star orchid. So <clears throat> Charles Darwin um, did a lot of biodiversity assessments and um, uh, individuals who were doing research in Madagascar brought this sample of this beautiful orchid to Charles Darwin. And as he was examining it, he dissected it. And what he found was that the nectar was found 12 inches deep in these spurs at the base of these flowers. And based on what he knew about how pollinator plant interactions work at the time, he hypothesized or predicted that there would have to be a pollinator that would be able to get to that nectar source in order for this flower to continue to exist and continue to be able to um, persist in that environment and attract those pollinators. And at that time, um, it, this wasn't a very well understood thing. And so people were very skeptical of this idea, thinking how could there be a pollinator that could reach these 12 inch deep spurs? So a lot of people didn't believe him. And then eventually it wasn't until decades after he died that they found this species of moth in Madagascar, which is Darwin's hawk moth. Um, and its Latin name translates to predicted moth because it's the moth that Charles Darwin had predicted would be um, present in order for that uh, flower to continue to persist. And so this kind of shows you just one specific example of this really interesting and beautiful partnership between two species of organisms that heavily rely on each other in order for their survival. And this is just one of many potential examples of these types of relationships that exist in our um, ecosystem. So 85% of plant species depend on animals for pollination. And out of, there are lots of different types of pollinator groups. You can see kind of a visual depiction of what some of these are in these two pictures. But in general, these are the most important pollinators of all. And that's because they have this really unique feature. They have these branched hairs on their body. So lots of different animals have hairs on their body, uh, but bees are unique in that they have these branched hairs. And depending on the group of bees that you're looking at, these branched hairs can be concentrated in different parts of these bees' body. So in the picture on the bottom left-hand side, you see um, this is a bee in the megachylid family. They usually have their uh, branched hairs located on the underside of their abdomen. In the bottom center, you see a bee that has these branched hairs concentrated on their hind leg. And then honeybees have this unique structure called a pollen basket or corbicula in which these hairs are located and they'll pack the pollen into these structures. Um, as they move it. So bees are these really amazing specialized organisms that can carry large quantities of pollen and transfer it from flower to flower. So when we're thinking about bees, usually the first bee that comes into mind and probably the most famous bee of all is our honeybee. But one thing that some may not know about North America is that honeybees aren't native to North America. They were brought here by European colonists when they moved here um, and arrived uh, on this continent in the early 1600s when people brought their beehives and all that equipment with them. And they didn't make it out to uh, our kind of more Western states in the Great Plains until around the 1800s or so. But there have been bees around North America for a very long time um, and that have evolved with a lot of our native plants. And so the United States is home to around what's estimated to be between 3,600 to over 4,000 species of native bees here. And a lot of our states have a really diverse 
uh, number of native bee species. Montana, for example, has between 500 to 750 species of bees. Um, Colorado has about 900 or more species. And so we have a lot of different, a lot, a huge diversity of bees that are often overlooked when we think about pollinators in the way that these are also really critical organisms to our ecosystem. So here are just examples of a few groups of native bee species that you're probably going to commonly see in your landscapes or have noticed before in your home gardens and things like that. And so bumblebees, they're pretty easily recognizable. There are these large, fuzzy, um, kind of um, goofy looking uh, animals that fly around in, in funny ways, um, but they're very, very distinct, very charismatic. Then we have our mason bees and leaf cutter bees. Um, that's another really interesting group of bees um, that uh, I'll talk about a little bit more later. We have some of our smaller groups of bees, for example, sweat bees. These are our shiny iridescent species that are shiny bronze, brown, or shiny green colored a lot of times. And we have a group of bees called our mining bees. And so these are just a few examples. This isn't a comprehensive list of the groups of bee species that we have here, but a few of the ones that you're commonly going to see in your home garden. So over the past couple of decades, scientists have been recording declines in overall biodiversity of lots of different organisms. And this is also being seen in the case of native bee species. And so where we're seeing uh, fewer instances of some previously existing common species of bees and fewer records of some of these bee species that we may not have seen for some time. So we're seeing kind of these um, global and local declines in native bee species. And there are a lot of different factors at play that are contributing and have impacts on biodiversity in general but it also native bee species, and these include things like overall loss of biodiversity, climate change, pest and disease issues, pollutants and toxins, agricultural intensification, pesticide use, and habitat loss. And each of these kinds of factors can be a whole um, you know, presentation on its own. But for today, I'm going to focus on two um, that home gardeners can have control over in terms of they can have a positive impact towards and two that um, uh, are gonna be the focus of what I'll be talking about today. So <clears throat> habitat loss is considered one of the leading factors impacting overall biodiversity and especially native bee population decline. And this is unsurprising if you live in any kind of changing landscape. And if you've lived in an area for some time, you're probably seeing a transformation of a lot of natural areas into more urbanized and suburbanized landscapes and this is consistent globally. In addition to that, certain pest management practices or um, pesticide impacts can also have uh, an effect on bee populations. And these can either be either le lethal effects, which are going to outright kill those bees, or sublethal effects, which can impact the health of those bees. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. So what can we do about it? And by we, I'm talking about home gardeners like myself. What are some impacts that we can have feasibly on these um, beneficial organisms? And what are, what are some of the things that we can incorporate in our own landscaping strategies to help mitigate some of these negative effects? So what do bees need? Similar to what humans need, bees need three main things. They need something to eat food or forage, they need a place to live, and they need protection or safety. And so in this case, um, when I'm talking about bees in general, I'm talking about food, nesting sites, and protection from pesticides specifically. So those are kind of three main things that bees um, need in order to survive and thrive in a landscape. When we're talking about pollinator habitat in general, this usually encompasses both the food as well as the nesting sites of those bees. So I'm gonna lump those together when I talk about habitat. Um, and then um, we're gonna talk a little bit about why this is important. <clears throat> so a little bit about bee ecology. Bees are what are called central place foragers. 
which means that they have one centralized nest location and they will travel a certain distance from that nest in order to find all the resources that they need, whether it's nesting materials, pollen, nectar, and any other kind of um, materials that they need for their survival. And this distance that they can travel from that central nest site can range anywhere from a couple of hundred feet for some of our really small bee species, all the way to a few miles for some of our larger bee species. So this is a very variable range, but for some of those bee species where you can only travel a couple hundred feet, you need to find everything that you need, AKA your habitat needs to encompass all the things that you need within that small area. So in terms of what these bees need, you wanna think about both nesting sites and floral resources um, and make sure that they are um, in proximity to each other and they're, you're able to provide all the things that bees need within a certain area. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So breaking habitat up a little bit more into the specifics, when we're talking about food and forage, for bees, this food is floral resources. So the nectar and pollen that's produced by these floral resources. And because we have a limited amount of time today, I can't talk about all of these different types of floral resources because that could be a couple hours on its own, but I wanted to direct you to some of these plant lists available and Carrie's gonna uh, post them in the chat so you guys can click on these links as well. But there are a, a great deal of plant lists available that are produced by a variety of different groups, including Xerces Society, Pollinator Partnership, and extension um, programs from different institutions. For example, Utah State and Colorado State University have great lists as well. And so these floral resources um, can be easily accessed through a lot of these different plant lists. And you may also have a lot of regional plant lists available. And one of the best places to kind of reach out to for more regionally adapted plant species or things that are more applicable to your exact um, area would be to contact your local extension offices and your local conservation district or your um, local plant societies. They will have a lot of that, that customized information specifically for you in terms of what these plant lists uh, encompass. But <clears throat> while we're thinking about these plants that we want to incorporate in the pollinator habitat, we want to think about a few main things. We want to keep a few main things in mind. So in terms of this food for bees, we want to think about the proximity of these floral resources to the ideal nesting habitat. So we want to make sure because of that foraging range, we want to make sure that you have floral resources and nesting habitat in close proximity to each other. We also want to think about floral resource diversity. So you want to aim to have a wide variety of different plants, including a variety of different species, types of plants that have different features, like different colors, textures, shapes, and sizes. And that's because of that um, you know, interaction with different types of plants that, that may have some specific relationships with different groups of bee species. So you want to try and cater to the greatest diversity of pollinators that you can. You also wanna think about succession. And so a lot of times we're focused on that kind of midsummer beautiful garden. If we're, if we're home gardeners or master gardeners, we're thinking about that beautiful showy flower show, usually mid season, but bees need food all season long. And so some of the most important times of year to provide this food is when there isn't very much else that is available in the landscape at that time. And usually that amounts to those very early season flowering plant resources, as well as those late season flowering plant resources, because there isn't as much to eat during that time. So aim to have something that is growing throughout the season, something that's gonna be flowering at any given time in the season, and especially think about those resources uh, in times of when other resources are scarce. <clears throat> When you're selecting the right plants, a few other considerations to keep in mind, you wanna select from a diverse array of resources. So you have access to some of those links that show a lot of different plant lists. Look through those and kind of select plants that will fit your environment, will be suited to your landscape, but also kind of um, be something that you want to incorporate in your landscape. Do a little bit of research to determine when those plants bloom. A lot of these risks, lists also have these plants kind of um, organized based on when they will bloom in the landscape, but that could vary a little bit based on where you live. And then you want to mix a variety 
and think about plants that have really complicated anatomy, try and avoid those types of plants because, for example, double petaled flowers takes a lot of energy for a bee to try and get past those in order to get to that nectar and pollen source. Other things you want to think about are the types of plants that you're incorporating. So if you think about things like trees and shrubs, um, just in terms of the size of the footprint that they have versus the concentration of flowers on those, they provide a huge bang for your buck in terms of a huge amount of flower um, uh, availability in a small area. Uh, in addition, perennials are often better than annual plants for pollinators, and, and research has shown that pollinator, more pollinator species will utilize perennial plants as opposed to annual plants in landscape. And then when you think about the types of plants, you want to think about native and non-native plants too. So native plants are an, a really excellent part of a pollinator garden, and a lot of um, these native plants have very specialized associations with our native bee species. These are the plants that evolved with our native bee species. But that doesn't mean that you rip out all of your non-native plants in the landscape because it doesn't only have to be native plants. So more and more research is showing now that a variety of both native and non-native pollinator species will use both native and non-native plants. And so a lot of our native um, pollinators will visit these non-native plants and you'll see differences in the types of bees that are visiting these native versus non-native plants. And a lot of these non-native plants still provide really nutritious sources of nectar and pollen for bees. So think about um, your garden and what is flowering and um, if you're seeing a lot of pollinators visiting those can be a good indication of the fact that that's a really nice pollinator plant. <clears throat> so now we're gonna move on to those nesting sites. So in terms of um, nesting sites, we wanna kind of learn a little bit about the main nesting biology for bees. So for nesting, most bee species, about 70% of them are ground nesting. Um, and these bees will build their, uh, either build their nests within the ground by digging those out or use existing cavities within the ground. An example of that are bumblebee species. The rest of those bee species, about 30% of them are cavity nesting bee species, which are usually going to nest above ground. And a majority of these species will use pre-existing cavities although a couple of these will um, create their own cavities. And an example that you might think of is a carpenter bee. So if you're a pollinator and you're looking at these really urbanized landscapes, you wanna try and think about these landscapes from the mindset of a pollinator and how you might be able to provide um, resources for them in a lot of these kind of growing and more developing landscapes. So when we're thinking about ground nesting bees and you're looking at some of these kind of common landscape types that we're used to seeing, um, if you're a ground nesting bee and you're looking at a picture like this, there are in general a few things wrong with this picture. So um, one example is there aren't that many flowering plants that are in this landscape. And secondly, and this is specific to those ground nesting bees, you see a lot of mulch incorporated in this landscape. And so mulch is a great tool for gardeners. It can have a lot of amazing benefits, including maintaining soil moisture, um, insulating those soils, depressing weeds, integrating nutrients back into the soil, depending on the type of mulch that you're using. But mulch can also be an impenetrable barrier for bees, for those ground nesting bee species, making it nearly impossible for them to access that soil. So I'm not saying don't use mulch, but you don't need to mulch every square inch of your landscape. So leave areas mulch free. That's gonna be the most important section, um, important component of providing that nesting habitat for these ground nesting bee species. Leaving access to bare soil, usually in out of the way spaces, places where you're not gonna walk around or dig around in, leaving those in out of the way spaces so that bees can utilize them and tunnel out their own nests. Now, when we're thinking about our cavity nesting bee species, here's where um, there are a few more things that we can do um, for this. And so one of my, my best advice for this case, and this is something that me, myself, as a self-proclaimed lazy gardener, um, is to leave your yard and garden a little wild. 
Um, a lot of times, you know, we might feel that itch around this time of year to clean up everything, deadhead everything to the ground and get it ready to go before winter. But uh, try and fight that urge and, and leave your landscapes a little bit wild and try and mimic what's found in nature because that's the best way to provide this habitat for these beneficial organisms, including our pollinator species. So leaving sections in your landscape that might have a couple of old wooden stumps, leaving your hollow stem grasses and woody stems and twigs and spent flowers um, around uh, without deadheading them, allowing there to be habitat for these bee species. Leaving your leaf litter, queen bumblebees will nest in leaf litter uh, over winter. And then a lot of our kind of um, pithy stems, so things like raspberry canes, these will chew out the inside um, of those stems like you see in the picture in the center top um, and they will build their nests within those. So leave varying heights of this dead vegetation in your landscape, which allows bees to utilize these as, as nesting habitats in a more natural way. But if you don't have access to enough space or don't have um, enough of these resources in your landscape, you can provide artificial nesting habitat for these cavity nesting bee species. And so these are either called trap nests, um, bee hotels, bee houses, cavity nests, and, and a variety of other names. But these are um, probably things that you have seen um, in local garden centers, um, in, in nurseries, in, in many stores, and you might even have these in your own home garden. So here's just a cool look at what the inside of some of these will look like. So um, in this, you'll see um, different types of materials based on the different types of bees that are nesting in this. And so in the top, you see this, this lined with leaves. And so <clears throat> in general, um, these are leaf cutter bee uh, nests. So these are cavity nesting bees and leaf cutter bees will cut out notches out of the leaves and sometimes even flower petals and use them to line and insulate the inside of their nest um, in order to um, uh, compartmentalize their offspring in there and protect them. And so um, you can also see resin or cellophane bees, which will use plant saps and use that to partition their different eggs that they'll lay in there. And then the mud, mud compartments are made by mason bees. They'll collect mud and, and they'll um, use that to kind of partition their offspring. And then in the bottom, um, these are wool carter bees. These bees will use plant hairs like from those plants like lamb's ears and um, rosy pussy toes, those plants that have that fuzzy foliage. They will cut those out and use those to kind of protect and insulate their offspring. So you want to incorporate these materials in that same area where you have these nesting blocks. And in terms of what these nesting materials uh, entail, this includes things like hollow tubes, either made of cardboard or bamboo, or you can use drilled wooden blocks. Um, you wanna opt for untreated wood, uh, aim for about four to eight inches deep and have a variety of diameters. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then bundles of twigs, brambles and branches that these will nest in between as well. <clears throat> So the picture on the left is from the Granby Hotel from Michigan State University, and on the right is from the Pollinator Garden um, at uh, Montana State University. And so these are really cool examples of, of what some of these, these bee hotels can look like. So you can make these yourself. You can drill your very own bee hotel. Um, and so in terms of what these look like, and um, I have um, Carrie's going to share the link to, to these specifics if you want to look more into this and create um, something that's very specific. But um, Nebraska uh, Extension created this really nice publication about how to build these solitary bee hotels and has a lot of great information within there in terms of the depth, the diameters, and what to aim for, as well as the types of bee groups that are going to be visiting those different sizes. Um, uh, of holes. And so this is a really nice publication where you can get into the, the very kind of specifics, the nitty gritty of what building these, these bee hotels can look like. But there are a few things in terms of what you don't want to do when it comes to um, drilling your own bee hotel. So you want to make sure you're paying atten attention 
to entrance diameter width and depth um, you don't want them to be too shallow or too wide too narrow you also want to drill evenly remove any kind of jagged edges and debris these don't like to nest in these jagged edged areas, but also you don't want to skewer your bee and shish kebab her on her way into building her nest. And then don't use varnish or painted wood. Untreated wood is best for these. And if you're like me and don't have a drill press and aren't very handy um, with, you know, um, the heavy kind of woodworking equipment, you can also purchase these nesting bee hotel materials, um, either by purchasing um, a structure that's entirely complete that has all of the features that you need or getting components of it and filling it up with the different kinds of materials that you want to. And so um, there are a lot of different sources from where you can get these, these bee box supplies. They have countless shapes, designs, and materials that they're made of. Um, and, and there um, isn't you know, one perfect way to build this. So there's a variety of different um, styles and features that you can incorporate. But there are a few things to keep in mind in terms of what not to buy. So you wanna minimize the use of plastic for nesting materials because that will limit kind of um, that oxygen exchange and will result in higher moisture accumulation, which can impact pest and disease issues in bees. You also want to pay attention to that diameter width and depth. And so that depth is especially important. So if you see that picture on the side, I purchased something like that online, but it was just a front facing view of that bee hotel. And when I got it, it was about an inch and a half deep. And so the issue with having these be too shallow is certain groups of bees, for example, mason bees, will provision their, their eggs so that they're laying male eggs at the very front of those nests and the female eggs in the very back of those nests. And this is because males are more expendable because males are basically only mating, whereas the females do everything else, including building those nests, collecting all those resources, laying those eggs, partitioning them and, and filling those out, um, and then they die. And so females are a more important investment. But what happens if you have these nest boxes be too shallow is you end up with um, a, a higher proportion of males than females, which, which can impact local populations of these groups of bees, which can have long-term consequences to those ecosystems as well. And then you want, want to also pay attention to the nest colors and materials, so you don't want it to be too hot and have limited ventilation. <clears throat> And the location is also very important in terms of where you place these. So you want these to be around eye level, so between three to five feet above the ground. And because bees are cold-blooded, they need external heat in order to get going, to, be, to begin all of their tasks for the day. And so they need access to that bright morning sun so that they can seize the day and get out there as soon as possible. And so aiming for a southeastern direction is usually best because that allows them access to that bright morning sun so that they can get going right then. You also want this to be somewhat sheltered, either under an overhang or have some sort of a waterproof covering. You don't need to worry about waterproofing these nests entirely because bees are naturally, um, their, their uh, pupae are naturally waterproof, but you don't want it to be um, a situation in which there are puddles or kind of areas in, in that nest box that are just sitting in water. You also want these to be located in a secure spot, not easily knocked off or moved with the wind or toppled over. <clears throat> and so walls or fixed structures or really sturdy fence posts are some of the best places to put these. And then you also want to make sure that these are placed away from heavy foot traffic and away from predators. So you're giving these bees the best chance for success in order to emerge. So here are a few things in terms of what not to do and where not to put them. So avoid access to where predators can have easy access to this buffet of helpless baby bees in these nest boxes. The picture on the left where you see a birdhouse bee hotel in one is actually something I saw for sale online. Um, and when I first saw this, I thought it was a joke, but it was something that people were selling. And so if you're doing something like this, you're basically setting up a, um, an Airbnb for birds, so bed and breakfast for um, birds. It isn't the best type of habitat for those bee species because 
you're you basically have this uh, amazing array of little bee burritos where a bird can come out of there and grab all that she wants to eat. So avoid areas where predators can easily access them. <clears throat> you also want to avoid harsh um, uh, environmental conditions. So avoid areas that have lots of water runoff, lots of harsh winds and too much heat. And then avoid high traffic areas such as doorways or frequently used areas because these bees are kind of really busy doing their thing um, and you don't want to get in their way and they don't want to be in your way either. And then um, maintenance is also an extremely important component of setting up these bee nesting boxes. Um, and a lot of times people think if you have this bee nesting block, you just put it up, you're set, you've done your task for the bees. But what's happening is when you're setting up these nesting blocks, you're creating an unnaturally large amount of nesting sites in a small space. And so um, as opposed to what's found in nature where you might find nests here and there um, located kind of in an array of areas, you have a large concentration of these in one small space, which encourages and increases the, the pressure of pest and disease issues. And so you wanna prevent these major pest and disease issues um, and reduce these disease pressures by making sure you maintain and clean these on a regular basis. So something that I do is I'll usually use those cardboard straws or bamboo straws and I'll compost them um, or uh, burn them after those bees have emerged. So I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of those materials after a single use. But if you are wanting to reuse those materials, if there are uh, more permanent type of materials, you wanna clean those before reuse. Um, and so cleaning them with a, a light bleach solution and letting them die before or dry before you let bees uh, get access to them again. And so for more information about this, that Nebraska publication where you see the link that has more information on the maintenance of those as well. <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about protection from pesticides, which is another important component. And so for this nesting habitat and this and these uh, forage sites that, that we've created, so for overall um, you know, bee habitat that we've created, we wanna make sure that this area is safe from pesticides. And when I'm talking about pesticides, a lot of times people um, equate the term pesticide to just insecticides. But pesticides contain a lot of different compounds, including herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and a lot of these other sides that you might hear about, like miticides, rodenticides, um, acaricides, things like that. So there's a variety of different uh, compounds that are all considered pesticides. And there are also, um, there is, we have a lot of information that's focused on insecticides and their negative impact, um, but other pesticides like herbicides and fungicides can also have negative impacts on beneficial organisms like bees. But unfortunately, most of these studies are focused specifically on insecticides and are usually looking at acute impact, so immediate kind of impact um, to their survival. And they're also usually focused on honeybees. So in terms of more chronic impacts or long-term impacts or on other bee species and other pollinator species, uh, species, there isn't as much information available, but more research is being conducted all the time. And so we're starting to build up our knowledge about this more and more. So these other pesticides, so um, one of the kind of impacts for herbicides in bees is that they have these indirect effects, which means an overall reduction of weeds and other habitat for beneficial insects. But there are also um, studies that show lethal effects of herbicides, for example, paraquat herbicides on beneficial insects. There are studies that are showing sublethal effects of glyphosate on honeybees, and these sublethal effects are things that can affect the long-term health of these bees, so affecting their gut microbes or reducing colony sensory fu function, um, preventing that colony, um, those individuals in the colony being able to navigate their way back to their nest and communicate well with each other. Um, and so these are impacts that can also occur in addition to that, certain foliar fungicides can also have impact um, on survival of certain bee species. And so, for example, commercial almond production, certain fungicides used in commercial almond production have resulted in decreased forager survival in honeybees. In addition, field realistic 
rates of chlorothalonil applications, which is another uh, commonly used fungicide, have resulted in overall reduction in biomass of Bombus terrestrial species. And then on top of that, we're also seeing these synergistic effects of certain products which will increase their susceptibility to insecticides. And so certain fungicides, for example, specifically, can increase that susceptibility of bees to certain insecticide groups, making them more of a lethal combination. And so a lot of these pesticides, including insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides, can all have these potential negative effects on these beneficial organisms like pollinators. So when you're thinking about these various lethal and sublethal effects, there are a few ways that these beneficial organisms can be exposed to these. These can either be through direct contact, through contaminated nest materials, indirect contact, contaminated nesting sites, or oral ingestion of systemic um, insecticides. And so this is a really nice graphic made by the Xerces Society that kind of showcases what some of these bee exposure pathways can look like. So a variety of different types of insecticides can have these negative impacts. So in terms of then how do you reduce these risks and how do you minimize these impacts, a lot of you are probably very familiar with IPM or integrated pest management. So when you're thinking about managing pests, you want to aim for um, the focusing on the, the best um, uh, environmentally responsible way to manage those pests. So this is the IPM triangle. For me, I consider it like the food pyramid of IPM where that base and the largest section should be your first focus. And then you move your way through the tiers of this. And as you've exhausted those possibilities um, uh, in terms of how you manage them, you may need to resort to chemical controls such as pesticides. But your main focus should be preventing these issues by selecting resistant materials, by uh, cultural control practices that can limit the likelihood of these pest and disease issues in your plants and using some of these physical and mechanical controls. Certain times biological controls can be helpful, um, but in terms of purchasing those biocontrol organisms, like purchasing lady beetles and mantids and lacewings, it's not often very responsible to introduce different organisms into a landscape, even if they may be native. And if you're interested more in learning about what that means, there um, is uh, an article that I wrote for the Garden Professor's blog about introduction of these beneficial organisms in landscapes and the potential impacts that they can have. But you need to have um, you need to keep these these in consideration if you are doing this. And then finally, your kind of last resort will be your chemical control strategy if these other options don't work. And the reason for that and the reason why we want to protect the environment is that pollinators aren't the only organisms in our landscape that are providing a benefit. So 98% of the arthropods that are found in our gardens are beneficial. They're important parts of that ecosystem. They're either providing services or they're maintaining the, the stability of those ecosystems. So a lot of these organisms are a really critical part. And so when we're thinking about that, 2% of organisms that are those pest organisms, maintaining those pest organisms at acceptable levels is indicative of a healthy garden ecosystem. And so one of the kind of ideal situations would be to reduce and ideally eliminate pesticide use that is just for cosmetic reasons. But um, reducing overall pesticide use for cosmetic reasons is a good start to that. Uh, in addition to that, you want to choose plants that are resistant to common pest issues. And you also want to maintain pest populations at acceptable levels and not opt for eradicating pests unless it is a pest that requires that. But for most of our common garden pests, we can maintain these pests at those acceptable levels to help sustain those other beneficial organisms in our landscape. And so <clears throat> if you decide that utilizing pesticides like insecticides are an important component of how you need to manage your garden, there are a few ways that you can, you can work on this. And um, starting out with this, you want to be a good neighbor. So if you are adjacent to beekeepers, you want to make sure you notify neighbor and beekeepers about planned pesticide applications. And you want to be especially extra vigilant if you're applying pesticides in or near sensitive areas such as wildlife refuges. 
And so you have to be particularly um, cognizant of those types of areas surrounding where you might need to apply these pesticides. And then you can also use some of these general bee safety guidelines um, and kind of fine tune your pesticide application strategies to minimize the risks to bees and other pollinators. And so I'm gonna give you a few examples of what some of these are. So first and foremost, you want to read and follow those label precautions. Um, if the label is the law, it's mandatory for you to use those products based on how that label says that you can use them and on in the situations that the label allows you to use them. But as of the year 2013, the EPA came out with this bee advisory box that's required for um, labeling on pesticide products that have a no negative impact on pollinators. So this, this little bee hazard symbol, which is a diamond shaped symbol with a bee in the center is indicative of a product that can have negative impact on bees. And so you would be extra careful if you are using a product like this um, in your landscape. In addition, you wanna aim for spraying in a time where you would have the lowest reduced potential risk to um, some of our pollinators. And so when we're talking about bees specifically, and this can be complicated because there are nocturnal and crepuscular pollinators, but in terms of the majority of um, bees specifically, most bees are diurnal. So you're they're gonna be the daytime foragers. So you're reducing that overall risk to most of these bee groups if you're applying those in the nighttime. In addition, you want to not overspray any plants that are flowering. And so you wanna make sure that you avoid pesticide applications in, in that are going to even um, inadvertently drift to plants that are flowering. And if you are applying a pesticide in a certain area over or next to areas where you have flowering plants, you can even cover those flowering plants to prevent that um, contamination with those pesticide products. And again, read and follow those label directions because those labels will often even state to not apply these during the bloom time. <clears throat> If you do need to apply it during a time based on the pest um, biology and the ideal timing of that application, um, then um, you can mow or prune off these oversprayed blooms. So for systemic insecticides in lawn care settings, specifically for, for kind of grub control, you wanna remove those flower heads before you apply this um, product uh, to prevent that um, systemic transfer into the nectar and pollen of those flowering lawn leaves. And then consider seasonal timing as well. And so a lot of our, um, um, a lot of our uh, homeowner, home garden pesticide products um, are often systemic insecticides. Those are some of the common ones to deal with a lot of those difficult to control pests that are usually either well protected or within leaf tissue that are harder to get to. And so systemic insecticides, neonicotinoids are an example of those, um, are ones that are going to be applied around a plant or within a plant and will be translocated throughout the tissues of the plant and residues of that, um, of that pesticide uh, active ingredient can be found inside the nectar and pollen of these plants. And so this is research that was done um, in a lab that um, I worked in at University of Kentucky, where we looked at the timing of application of systemic two, two different systemic insecticides. We um, applied them spring pre-bloom and tested those blooms. Then we applied them summer right after they were done blooming and tested next year's blooms and fall um, pre-bloom. So tested the spring blooms after the fall application. So um, the products that we were looking at were imidacloprid and dinotefuron, which are two common neonicotinoid systemic insecticides. And so um, we evaluated the concentrations of these products in the nectar following those applications in that following set of blooms. And what we found was both of these products in the spring pre-bloom applications resulted in a higher concentration than what is considered acceptable or safe for the health of pollinators. So they exceeded those. And in addition to that, um, even in um, those fall pre-blooms, these residues still exceeded those, um, uh, those values that are considered to negatively impact bees. And so <clears throat> with this, um, but what another cool thing that we found with this was, 
that the early post womb ap application resulted in um, a lower risk in terms of a, an amount of imidacloprid that resulted in um, a, a threshold that was lower than what's considered negatively impacting bees. And so this can be something to think about. So dinotefiron was still um, persistent in that after a year, but imidacloprid, for example, specifically was safer to use in that situation because that residue was lower than what's considered negatively impacting these. So you can consider a few things from this. So you using a different type of product um, for that systemic, if it's labeled for that use and, and going to work in that situation, but also thinking of that timing and timing it right after that bloom period to reduce just that exposure to pollinators. In addition, we also want to try and opt for products that are relatively non-hazardous for bees. And this can be pretty difficult to determine um, because there's a lot of information out there, but a few kind of general rule of thumb things to keep in mind, using selective insecticides or reducing the use of broad spectrum insecticides around flowers can reduce some of those risks. Aiming for products that have lower residual activity in the landscape can help reduce those risks. But remember that Natural does not equal safe, and organic insecticides aren't necessarily going to be safer for pollinators than synthetic or conventional insecticides and other pesticide products. So make sure that you are paying attention to the type of product and always read and follow those label directions. But if you are interested, um, University of California IPM has this really cool tool, this web link will be posted for you as well, where you can go on this website and type in a common name um, or uh, the uh, trade name of a different product, and it'll show you the risk to bees um, based on what we have in terms of information and research on this product. So this is a nice tool to go and access more information about some of these products to help you make those decisions and help you use those products more safely in your landscapes. And then <clears throat> finally, you can consider different types of formulation. So this was another study that was done in um, the lab that I worked in at University of Kentucky, where looking at um, uh, sprays versus granular applications of weed and, free, weed and feed products for lawns with grub treatments incorporated, um, they exposed these um, lawn weeds to bumblebee colonies and tented them on there. And what they found was that the spray treatments resulted in negative impacts on those bees, including lower birth weight and reduced queen production, but using um, a different, a granular formulation um, and, and uh, applying that resulted in no adverse effects to those bumblebee colonies that were exposed. <clears throat> then when you're thinking about turf weed management in bees, a few things to keep in mind about weed issues. In general, um, a lot of chronic weed problems occur in lawns that aren't managed very well, aren't very healthy, aren't thriving, and aren't able to outcompete those weed issues. And so there are a lot of other considerations and environmental issues at play in those lawns that are resulting in a lot of these common weedy issues. But when you're thinking about lawns and those lawn weeds, think about why that weed is there in the first place. Is it a weed? Is it important to eliminate? And what the safest way to eliminate it is. But you might not um, realize how some of these lawn weeds can be really important to pollinators in urban landscapes. And so <clears throat> this was researched by this, that same group, um, Dr. Jonathan Larson, um, in the Potter Lab at University of Kentucky, and, and they surveyed um, a lot of these common lawn weeds like dandelion and clover for pollinators in Kentucky lawns. And they found more than 50 species of pollinators that were utilizing these floral resources. And this included 37 species of bees, including several rare and declining native bumblebee species that were foraging on these. And so if you're thinking of more urban environments, some of these lawn weeds can be some of the most consistent sources of food for these pollinators in these highly urbanized areas, and they can act as stepping stones between remnants of natural habitat for these pollinators. So in terms of what you can do to help bees in this situation, think about what level of lawn excellence that you're wanting to maintain. What are you willing to um, overlook? So I'm not saying do those things on the right-hand side of the image uh, because that's not a very responsible way to take care of your landscape. But if you have patches of some of these common flowering lawn weeds like clover, um, why not leave them there if they're healthy and they're surviving in that landscape? Your lawn still looks nice. 
<clears throat> but right now, uh, a few things that have been kind of becoming popular um, are things like no mo may. And although the intention behind this is a really good one because it's encouraging people to think about pollinators and provide food and resources for them, um, not mowing your lawn for the entire month of May for some of our um, kind of Midwest and Northern climates, um, you're, you think what'll happen is that your, your lawn is gonna turn into this beautiful wildflower meadow. But what really happens is that you have this really overgrown lawn environment that is, is really difficult to maintain after the fact. And so this is not going to turn your lawn into a pollinator meadow. So lawns can grow a lot in a one month period of time. And when you're thinking about responsible maintenance of your lawn, you're only supposed to remove one third of that blade of grass in any given mowing. And how many of us have a lawnmower that can go up to eight or nine inches in height so that we're responsibly reducing the size of that lawn afterwards? And so um, cutting off too much can really negatively impact your turf, making it patchy, leaving more way for um, potentially um, other weeds like noxious weeds to take over. And so overall, there are better ways to provide food for pollinators. So you can either let some of your lawn weeds go, but don't go overboard by not mowing your lawn for the entire month of May. You can reduce the frequency of mowing to maybe every other week or so. And so you can still have those flowering lawn weeds, but not have a really unhealthy lawn or you can intentionally plant things, um, plant that diversity of plants for pollinators. And then if you are interested, um, University of Minnesota, if you Google their bee lawns, they have a really cool project that talks about how you can kind of get the best of both worlds by incorporating low growing flowering plants in with um, lower maintenance turf species like fine fescues, where you're intentionally providing this pollinator habitat that is more versatile, so this isn't um, for good for heavy use because it won't withstand heavy wear and tear, but it will show you um, a way that you can have a little bit of the best of both worlds, still have some of that lawn with that intentionally um, incorporated pollinator habitat. Other things that you can do, it doesn't need to be a very large area to have a net positive effect on beneficial organisms. More of our research is showing that a lot of these insects are able to utilize some of these smaller patches of habitat. You can also educate others by using by using signage or communicating your information, referring people to these resources. And in a lot of places, people live in um, uh, areas that have HOAs. So I like to talk about mullet gardens where you can have your kind of perfect manicured garden at the front um, with your party in the back where you have your designated pollinator areas. So you're again, getting the best of both worlds. Um, so for more information on this, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, ARS, their Sea Society and Pollinator Partnership are great resources. In addition, local extension offices and con conservation districts also have a lot of great information for you. And then I wanted to show this publication that we just came out with uh, at Montana State University this year that will be posted in the chat for you to look at, which is talking about how to create this native bee habitat for gardens. Um, and then um, the Garden Professor's blog is a really nice resource for um, looking at science-based, research-based uh, gardening information um, for anyone who's interested in the topic of gardening, including home gardeners and master gardeners. So this debunks kind of common myths and then talks about the science behind how to best manage your garden. 